no poison ivy. We got, got tulips and roses. And isn't that what it's supposed to be like in our life with God? And we sometimes count it as a tragedy that he points out the poison ivy. He just wants us to avoid it. <laughs> He's not trying to introduce it to us. He's just saying, see that? <laughs> avoid that. <laughs> you don't wear that as a wreath on your head. <laughs> the victor's wreath, poison ivy. <laughs> Shall we bow our hearts before him? Would we humbly come before you and how gracious you are and great you are. We are in desperate need of your word for your word transforms us your word leads us into your presence your word oh it is inspiring when your spirit speaks it to us so enable us lord by the power of your spirit to receive your instruction to receive your word as only you can your transforming work is busy within us and we thank you we trust you you said that you would finish the good work that you started. We thank you. And it's not based upon us. It's based upon what you said. We receive that by faith and we state we will cooperate with you. And everything you instruct us in. We will not resist your instructions. For you come to bring us life and peace and joy and life abundantly. How we praise you and thank you for that. In Jesus' great and precious and powerful name I pray. Amen. Amen. It was a long night. One time in my life. It was darkness. As far as I could see. It was cold. 75 to 78 below zero. For months on end, I spent approximately three and a half months north of Alaska, out on the ice of the Arctic Ocean, in darkness. My only light was somewhat a moon that would occasionally come out, and it would light the snowscape. The Roy Borealis was an exciting thing too would glisten through the sky and sometime be brighter than a full moon in lighting up the darkness I, I was in because of the state of that darkness being frozen it was somewhat reflective and when the Rory Borealis was out and the moon was out you could see probably 15 to 20 miles even though there was no sun there was a few days or a few nights like that. The sun never comes out in the winter time. Just the moon makes a big circle in the sky. Your vision is very limited. There are creatures that roam around in the dark up there. Creatures that hunt man. You remember the fluffy little teddy bear? Well the little fluffy teddy bears up there think you're a fluffy seal. <laughs> and they come to visit quite frequently all kinds of desperate loneliness in that darkness we had all kinds of artificial lights in order to maintain our living complex it took about 3,000 gallons of fuel a day which we flew back and forth in 10 helicopters 24 hours a day as long as they could fly had to stock up on fuel because we used three to four thousand gallons a day of fuel in order to produce the light and heat that we needed. The dismal time because I decided to stay for the winter. And the winter meant being in darkness for three to four months with only artificial light. It does something to one soul to be in darkness that long had really put a longing for the light within me. It put a desire deep, deep within me to be in God's presence because I think during that period of time I was going through one of the most difficult periods of my life. My entire life had been set on fire and everything that I loved and knew was, had been burned up. 
I was going through terrible heartaches of losing my children and my family and my livelihood and my family and my children and my family and <laughs> can y'all figure out what it was? <laughs> oh, they were dark days. I wept for days on end with crystal tears that would fall to the ground because they would be frozen when they would hit. And the tragedy that occurred and then to be in darkness for that extended period of time worked its toll in the depths of my soul. And I can remember after being in darkness for four months, leaving for a couple of weeks, and when we first breached through the atmosphere of the clouds that cover the darkness and reached an altitude of about 30,000 feet. For the first time in four months, I saw the crest of the sun on the edge of the earth, and my soul leapt. It leapt. Because I'd only been in artificial light, and artificial light will not suffice for us for an extended period of time. I liken that artificial light as to what we can extract out of God's Word because it's not him. It's the essence of him that gives us the direction of how to get to him. It is a lesser light, but the light is meant to bring us into his presence so that we can behold him and the brilliance of him and the splendor of him. Needless to say, in the crashing and burning of my life, it really caused me to press into my God. The sorrows were so great, they were rolling over my soul. But my Lord would come and say, is it okay? I'll comfort you. He would wrap his arms around me for days on end. He said, you must work. You must work. You must work. Because he knew the night was howling. The night and its destructive forces were against me. He said, Curtis, make yourself as busy as you can be in your life till you can't do anything but sleep when you get off. So I, I work 16 to 18 hours a day, seven days a week for four months straight. Till I would just, when I dropped, I dropped. Sometimes I wouldn't even undress. I'd fold up in a chair or something and wake up and ready to go to work the next morning. My thought process around that is there's a light that we need that gives us purpose in life and hope in life that we can't receive out of us just playing church. We can't receive out of us just re re reading the Word. The Word is the door. The Word is something that's supposed to get us there. Inside the light, once I saw the sun, it's like the promises of God, the presence of God, came to life again in me. It was a dark winter. Many of us are experiencing and have experienced dark winters. And the only reason they're dark is because it didn't have the sun. And the sun finally crests out. It increases like 20 to 22 minutes a day up there until you have sun 24 hours a day. And it is a glorious thing. I wore myself out in summer times working up there with the sun spinning in a big circle in the sky and you knew it was midnight when it was over here and you knew it was noon when it was over here. <laughs> and it was glorious to have sun 24 hours a day. Many men I worked with cursed, oh, son, I can't sleep. And I thought, man, I take sun any day over constant darkness. Give me the sun. It was a very challenging thing for me when my God asked me to come to the Northwest. I remembered the darkness. I remembered the greatest trauma of my life. I remember the isolation. When he said, I want you to go to the Northwest, I thought, oh, darkness, rain. I hate rain. It was an invitation back to those dark times and a fear because I knew how they had swelled over my soul and nearly drowned my existence. I rejoiced that when I came to the Northwest, it was not what I thought it would be. 
which is my whole point. God's plan for us is never what we think it'll be. But yet we can always think and attach the darkest thoughts to it. We don't understand when he calls us and he directs us. There's light available. His light. His personal presence. His personal touch. A revelation of him. The living word. A living word standing in our midst. His breath that stands 24 hours a day to whether if we look at midnight he's standing there in it's brilliant light if we look at noon the only thing we know is he's standing on the other side of us so that the whole landscape of our eyes and our human character and our understanding is bathed in the presence of his light that is the state that he wants to bring his church into you and I a constant abiding in the light a promise all promises are fulfilled when we stand in his light. All promises are distributed when we stand in his magnificent light. The revealing of his nature, the promises of his indwelling spirit, all of those things occur when we stand totally in the brilliance of his light. It says in the book of Revelation that we will not need the sun. He will be our light. I submit to you, the scripture says that we are supposed to be children of the light. That he is the father of the lights. Who are we? We're children of the light. He is the father of the lights, the plural. <laughs> so the radiance of his Shekinah presence, the glory and the awesomeness of his great immensity that covers the universe is supposed to be in plain view in our relationship with him. If he abides with us in that aspect, there are no nights. There's only the day. And we only will live in the day. We'll only live and bask in the joy of the day. No matter what circumstances surround us, no matter what comes against us, when we see trials and tribulations that are beyond our comprehension, when we see things that daunt our soul and make us downcast, what we need to do is say, Oh, look up, my soul. Look up. For your Redeemer is near. Look up because your God, what is He going to do now? Oh, He's the one that pulls rabbits out of the hat. He is the one. Oh, God, I am looking for your hand to move. Our responses inside of us is the light is there. is a great hope and expectation of waiting to see how our God moves with the deliverances. I'm still here. I'm still breathing in and out. I'm still standing before you. I have been in so many perils in my life. I could write a book about them. <laughs> Actually, you know many of them. There's many you don't. Perils that God has delivered me from. And one thing that he has taught me as long as I stand in the light and I really look to see see I, I don't want to be just delivered from my circumstance being delivered from the circumstance is nothing I want to see my great God's hand move in the midst of the circumstances Meshach, Shadrach and Abednego they're standing in the fire and they refuse to stand in it they would not have had a meeting with their great God, seeing him and hearing him and walking with him and talking with him. And, and Daniel in the lion's den, the king looks down, oh, Daniel, there's one who's like the son of God down there. And he, yes, yeah, so oh great king, sure enough. <laughs> I'm petting the kitty down here. You want to come down and pet the kitty with me? He got to be with the Shekinah presence of his great God. And men gave great reports of the radiance of God's presence as he brought deliverance in the midst of our trials and tribulation. Your trials and tribulations in your life, we have to learn to rejoice. How many things does it say we're supposed to rejoice about? All things. Oh, y'all are from the south. That's right, all. <laughs> Not that black stuff that comes out of the ground. It's our great God. He is all in all. And he's much more valuable than all the oil on the earth. And he is the oil of the earth, the Holy Spirit. With that, shall we get off into the little scripture? This is the verdict then. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of the light. Why? 
because their deeds were evil. And we talked about they and them, I don't know, in some session not too long ago. They and them, who are they? <laughs> we don't know, but we should sure use they and them. But here we have a passage of Scripture that says their deeds were evil. If we are not in the light, our deeds then are evil. Anything that's not led by the Spirit is out of our own consciousness, and no matter how good we think it is, the social works of man never measure up to good. They only measure up to evil. So there's either God's way or evil. There's either God's manifest presence or our presence making decisions and directives. Everyone who does evil hates the light. I fell into evil several times in my life. But when I fell into it, I wanted out of it. I hated what I was doing. I hated myself for doing what I was doing. I hated evil. I didn't hate the light. And I finally, through the power of the Spirit, gained enough strength to drag an unwilling body into the light. And when I drug it, drug it into the light, there was an exposure of it. It says, everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. We have to get to the point that we're not afraid of our deeds being exposed. We need them exposed. We hide them from our brothers and sisters. We hide them from our family. We, hide, we, we try to hide it from God. Everybody reads us like a book and knows the way we feel and act. They can see our, our responses. They can see our attitudes. And there's several people that I want to put in this little play. There's uh, Pouting Paul. <laughs> there's Lying Lori. I changed some names around here. <laughs> there's Angry Aaron. There's Pity Patty. There's Poor Me Sarah Lee. <laughs> there's Controlling Connie. There's Harsh Harry. And Hateful Hannah. Our actions and our attitudes before are gone, when our attitudes go south, it means we're not in the light. That's the first sensor before evil ever comes. There begins to be a resistance inside our hearts and minds towards our God, set up in rebellion, and once there's resistance there in the attitude, now I can't do because my will doesn't want to do, because my will doesn't want to be in the light. My will wants to go do its thing and spend its own time and its own purposes for its own self-gratification. We call that pleasures. Oh, better word, U.S. word. I deserve some recreation. <laughs> I'm going to treat myself to the spa. Get one of those mayonnaise baths or whatever they do in those places, you know. <laughs> Oh, they, they don't use mayonnaise? <laughs> so people are laughing. That means you've been there, and you know they use something else, right? <laughs> uh, we treat our body to luxury, 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 luxury. Matter of fact, one of the definitions of lust of the flesh is the enjoyment of the luxuries of life. <laughs> Did you know that? Our little pets that we put on our mantles, whatever size they may be, Whatever cost they may consume us. We place them before God. We don't want to bring them out into the light because we know what His Spirit says about them. We already know. We're resistant. We're not willing to bring our little toys out into the light because it will expose our lies. Remember that one of the persons in there is lying, Larry. It'll expose our lies. See, all these are these are attitudes of the mind and attitudes of, of, of us. We know it's a lie. I don't want to get rid of it. And if I don't want to get rid of it, and I now I'm I'm acting out in my mindset as lying Larry. God didn't mind. He gave me that. I I, I have a right. To, I, I'm not wanting to put it in the light. Because I'm it takes my time from Jesus. It takes my time from being in the celestial presence and serving my living God. And when I get to heaven, it's written in the book. I don't know if you know this. You have a time card in that book. <laughs> Every time you've done anything for God, cha-ching. And when you checked out, cha-ching. 
Every moment, every second is added up of your service unto God. What does your book say? And then there's the sour clock up there that <laughs> that's self-service there's another book that's got a lot of those dong in them I remember the guy that arrived in heaven and Peter met him and he said okay uh, I'll get you checked in here and he saw all these clocks hanging on the walls you know and he said what is this and he said well every time that hand moves one notch that means somebody's done a sin and that's the way we keep track of it everybody's got their own clock and, oh wow oh okay well I, I received Jesus now I know I did lots of sinning but I, I received Jesus so what well, Jesus you know Peter said well calm down if you received him then you know our Lord he can rewind that clock he can reset it and and they looked and looked and looked and they come back and they said sir uh, we're, we're we haven't been able to find your clock and he reached over and talked to Paul, and Paul said, ah, and, he, and he, oh, oh, we found it. And he, well, where did you find it? And it was it was right there on the desk. It was being used as a fan, you know. <laughs> Everything's kept track of there in heaven. And what do we think we're getting by with? You know, Part of our problem is we like to get lost in these things of attitudes of sins, of downcastness, of pouting, of I, I, if I don't get my way, I'm, I'm, I'm in a bad mood. Your Lord Jesus, if you want the light close, you can't be in a bad mood. You don't realize he was consummately the happiest, most joyful man on the face of the earth and do you realize he delights in the joy of human beings everything is recorded in scripture it's about him establishing a domain that brings absolute utter delight and joy to himself and to us and so when he comes and looks at us I didn't get my way I, um, you know whoa hey pickle puss <laughs> I'm here. You give me a smile. Come on. I'll go pray about it. You know. Oh, we need to lose our childish ways. Now, when my little daughter's pouted, I dealt with it. I took it as a personal offense to not be in communion with me and not do what they were supposed to do in life. And God says, you... uh their wagon's crooked. Straighten that wagon out. <laughs> and they can tell you, it got straightened out that quick. There's one thing my mama taught me. She said, you say it once, and you never give a second warning. They, I earned if I didn't. She, she told me once, and that may be just once for the week. Shouldn't that be enough? I'm sure I was more when I was two. But there's the problem. We want to hear God say it over and over and over again. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. And did it drive you nuts when you have to constantly tell some kid, don't, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. You think, my goodness. I, you, you know, you, 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 you need to get out the stick if you got a kid that way. And not say nothing. Just say, come here. Whack, 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 whack. <laughs> and the kid says, what was that for? Well, you know what it's for. You tell me. You can't tell me. I'll give you three more. <laughs> you know, I, I, our God. We know how our attitudes are towards Him. But see, our self-will says, "I got a right to feel this way. I got a right." See, we use these pouty attitudes to control people around us. And what's control? The definition of that's pharmacia in the Greek. And what's pharmacia? Witchcraft. That's right. Go buy you a wash pot and get you some lizard tongues and bat ears and start getting you some chants going out there in the front yard. So everybody and, and go see how many Christians you can get to join in in your pity party. Your lizard party. Because we use our emotions that are supposed to be connected to God for the purposes of manipulating people around us to get our will in our way. Now, that's a sad thing to say, but my whole point in bringing that out we choose 
to stand in darkness. When we're acting that way, when we have that mindset, we have to grow up and say, no, in the name of Jesus, I will not respond or act that way. I will not. I will not give myself that lustful luxury. I have no rights. The scripture says I am supposed to rejoice in how many things? All things. All. 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 Oh, we're supposed to be jumping up and down. Yeah, praise God. <laughs> Rejoice. That's what rejoicing is. There's this connotation in Scripture. It's spinning around wildly thanking Him <laughs> with great joy. Now, we face some tremendous situations in this life. Our Lord knows that. He has sympathy for us, but not if we're going to pout and not if we're going to try to do it our own way. All we need to do is come into the light and our soul will begin to be re revived, will it not? And, and then it, what we need, you, you need your soul revived? Or do, you, or do you feel like a boat that's carried along with the waves? Like, oh, here comes another swell. Okay, here comes somebody else. You know, you got all these high maintenance people and just a big swell like a, like a, like a tsunami. <laughs> Holy mackerel. I warned you. I told you. Here comes your tsunami and it's headed for my life. <laughs> I don't know if you know this or not. If your life is Jesus' life, he can speak to the waves and rebuke them. Can he not? Did he not do that? Have you got any waves that you need him to speak to? Well, you just cozy up beside him and get rid of your coughing attitudes and your childlike ways of being trying to use angry or pity, pity or poor me or trying to control or, or harsh. Uh, those are things that are offensive to our God that bring darkness. We choose to step in the darkness. We're supposed to be a creature with a smile on our face that came from the heart. Um, my daughter, if she has acted up, which she has in times past. The first time I had to hand her over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. I don't. Did you know that it says that in the scripture? Someone turns away from God and they're walking with God and the sin gets bad enough, we're just supposed to... See, Paul commanded, we're supposed to call forth the elders and the elders of the church, the leader of the church, the bishop of the church, says, Satan, we turn this person over to you. Come and get him. The first time I did that, I was scared to death. But the Lord, he was breathing hot down my neck and said, Do you want to save your daughter? Or do you want to reinforce her actions and attitudes where she'll lose her salvation? Oh, dear God. I don't want to do that. And I wept and wept and wept. And okay, I obeyed him. And, and I handed her over to Satan. And sure enough, see, part of me, the flesh man inside, well... If, if Satan comes, he'll, he'll burn up her place to live, and then I'll have to take care of her. <laughs> all, all flesh in her, huh? <laughs> I had to get put out in the open there. <laughs> uh, uh, and I, 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 I was obedient. I finally got through myself and wanted to do what the Word said. And when I called forth Satan, sure enough, she lost her house, her car, her job, and nearly lost her children, and nearly lost her life. But in the midst of that, a couple, three months rolled by, and she come running, screaming, running back to God. And she didn't go back in darkness for probably a couple years. And she fell again, and now I'm a little braver. Wait, I need my daughter to be in light. It worked last time. And See, the problem is we don't want to trust God. We don't want to stand completely in the light because we have some personal ownership of what's going on We think. We forget that our fight's not against flesh and blood. What are we? Flesh and blood. Well, my fight for my children is not against me. It's not against... I, I put the word in my kids. They made a choice to turn from it. And there were some other circumstances of being a split family and raised in with a mother which didn't care about God. And I had cost them a lot cost me a lot because I, I realized that when I went through a divorce uh, it was only things I planted it was only things I planted God gives us warning whatever you plant you're going to reap right 
I rep. I I I I, I reaped. Because when I was in high school, I was a wild thing. I was kind of calm and quiet and gentle on the outside, but I, I was wild when it comes to some particular sinning. I excelled at that particular darkness, and at that particular darkness, I had sown a bunch of seeds, and I reaped those seeds. But I came and stood in the light with those seeds in my hand and said, Yes, my Lord. And he took those seeds out of my hand. He said, Okay, I take those out of your hand. I reaped for... Seven years of sorrow as a result of some of my actions. Seven years of tears. But there was a day that that ended. That God said, okay, they're on their own. When they came to live with me there in the Arlington area, my older girl, when she got married and had children, he said, this is their actions. You've given them the word. That was nothing to do with you. They make choices just like you made bad choices. I thought, okay, Lord. I can, I can handle that. Because, see, the enemy has the right to come close and say, see there what you did, because we did, right? <laughs> we know we did. <laughs> remember when you were in dark? Oh, yeah, I remember. I'm trying to forget, but <laughs> unfortunately, I remember. And you know what uh, my response to him is? But my God delivered me and brought me into the light. And I have laid all those things before men. I hide no sin, no action, no failure. I hide nothing. Everything is in the light, and I stand with him. Now, have you got anything else to say to him? (laughs) Because I don't speak serpent. (laughs) I've got to stop speaking the language. And I don't know if you know it or not. Satan has his own language, and it has to do with me, myself, and I. So if I'm pitying about myself and my past... That's me, myself, and I. He's getting me to speak his language and think his language. If I'm, if I'm posturing and pouting because I want my way, that's me, myself, and I. That's his language. If I'm into pity, that's me, myself, and I. That's his language. It's not my God's language. If I'm into controlling, I've got to get these things managed. I'm practicing witchcraft. That's his language. He was a big control freak. They wanted to take things over from God. If I'm harsh, all those emotions that drive us are connected into the dark rooms of our life that we don't want God in we must not only we don't need to let him in we need to call and cry out oh God come and bring your light because I I need some light here because if we can get the light in there his light will take care of scorpions and snakers snakes and and spiders and and all those creatures of darkness flee from his presence in our darkest rooms we need to invite him into we need to beg for him to come we need to stand up and shout with joy devil you're in for it I'm calling Jesus I don't care what he sees Jesus come come into this room of darkness of mine he'll flee we're afraid to get him there because Satan said now you know he's really going to punish you when he shows up because this is your fault (laughs) my fight's not against flesh and blood it's against principalities and powers of darkness it's not my fault yes I sowed I reaped but I also can reap a harvest of righteousness and Jesus burns up any seeds when he shows up. His radiance is so brilliant, it burns up everything of the past. It burns up everything that will tackle the future and take us out of God's presence because his light totally 100% brings everything to the surface so the weeds can be picked, the seeds can be thrown out. It can be There can be a bountiful harvest. There can be holy ground that can be made. Fire can come from heaven in the form of his light surrounding us and hovering over us and setting us free everything that's in there that's yucky I don't care if you got a swamp it'll be vaporized (laughs) it'll become solid ground he'll get out his D9 plow and and come raking across your land and say praise God we're in the light I brought the bulldozer we're going to do some cultivating (laughs) he can pull down the trees of our wickedest thoughts he can extract the roots of the deepest sin that's within us I had a friend of mine his uh, his father bought I think it was 160 sections of land out in West Texas and he bought about 10 D9 caterpillars and that's a that's that's a hefty little caterpillar I promise you 
they run over your house, it'd be under one track. <laughs> They're big. Well, not quite that big, but <laughs> you'd think that if they were sitting on your house. <laughs> and the, these things went across that desert floor with these giant hooks that went 10 feet down into the earth, pulling out every root of the mesquite trees, and they piled those things up, 160 sections of them, and burnt the roots and burnt the trees. And then they come back with 60-inch deep... 60 inch deep disc plows and turn that ground over five foot upside down on itself now your God is in the business of creating good soil in your life if you'll come out in his presence you'll see some heavy artillery and heavy equipment coming and don't think it's the enemy he's got no D9s <laughs> he runs he flees he's barefooted and naked <laughs> Jesus stripped him He's got nothing except a little chat up. And, he, and as long as we speak his language and stand in his presence and are willing to keep little shadows of darkness, he stands and talks to us. Teaches us his way so we become sulky. Ever meet sulky person? He's like, uh, yeah. Would you like a lollipop? <laughs> well, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> Jesus comes and says, come on. That's his ways. He's sullen. He's a sad sack. He's miserable. You don't have to be. Step into the light. That light, when I stood up in that plane and I'm looking out the window and I'm going, yes, oh, good, yes. And I'm just looking through a little portal. I got light after four months. It meant something to me. This light that Jesus is, it makes available to us, it is transforming light. Matter of fact, in Psalms, it said, But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light. Face up to the truth of what you've been in past. Who cares? Didn't Jesus come to rescue us for that? Didn't he come to die for that and wash it away? Didn't he hang it on the cross? And why are we still talking about it if he left it down in the dirt, in the darkest, deepest dungeons, away from himself that he could get it? Separated all of our sin, talking about them, separated as far from God as you can get. And I don't know how far that is. I don't know how many dimensions that is away. He put it someplace that's out of his sight. I praise God. I've got no right to talk about my past unless I own it. Satan wants to talk about it, but he's got no right to talk about it. There is no past. If Jesus took it upon himself, then there is no past, is there? What are you doing with your dredges out over in his turf? There's only one person that can go down and get that information and bring it back to you. That's Satan. Recognize his voice. Begin to separate his voice from yours. Because he's the one that comes and brings you the misery. He's the one that comes and speaks to you. He's the one that penetrates our thought processes so that we turn sour on life. Sour on life. That's a miserable existence. The joy of the continents of the Lord. We are supposed to be joyous in all circumstances. Now, you can't get there on your own. It takes learning how to come into the light because the light will do this. The truth will do this. And where do we get the truth? When we come into light, so that it may be seen plainly. Now, who needs to see it plainly? Does God? We do. See, the problem is, as much of the description of what we receive of ourselves and our past actions and deeds and purposes, the description that's given to us is given to us by our enemy. Oh, you can really trust him to give you an accurate description of your life, can't you? I mean, before he gets through, you're damned if you do and damned if you don't. You can't go back and you can't go on. You're stuck and he makes you the most miserable creature on planet Earth. And it's all because we won't come plainly and stand in the light where Jesus Christ can talk to us about these things and tell us the truth about them instead of us listening to the enemy giving us explanations of what we did. We don't know what makes us tick. I'm not no super psychologist, and, I, and I'm, 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 even if I was, I would be, if I was, I'd be psycho. I wouldn't be able to help you. <laughs> you know? I'd be using man's learned understanding from Satan himself to interpret God's stuff for your life. And that would just make you more miserable. 
Never anybody, never met anybody that went to a psycho babbler that their life didn't end up in some sort of term, torment. They were not delivered. They were temporarily, there were some transfers of some temporary miseries to something else, but they were never set free. And Jesus intends when we come into the light to be set free. So that if we come into that light, the truth, the light, so that it may be seen plainly, then what he has done has been done through God. Why would that statement be in there? Because I can see plainly. If I can see the truth of my actions, and I see the truth of my surrender to Christ, I can see the truth that they plainly were put upon Jesus Christ, and plainly they were dumped in the dump ground of the filth and the vile of, of that, that place. And I can only see that if I'm in the light in Jesus in God, through God, right? You all understand that little section now? <laughs> Pretty simple. I'm you all probably already understood that. <laughs> Psalms 119, 30. The entrance of your words gives light. Now, if you're in a dark dungeon somewhere, you peer out every once in a while. Open the doors as wide as you can get them. You need the entrance of his light because it gives understanding to the simple. Simple means you don't understand the complexities of God of how to get out of the situation you're in. You can't. All you can do is open the doors to let light in, and when you see the light, what is it? Come to the light. <laughs> you know, hear all these experiences of people dying and being in tunnels and the light's calling them, you know. Well, you're supposed to be alive. The light's calling you. <laughs> they were just having a flashback of what was, what was going on here on earth. All the time the light is calling us, come to the light. <laughs> they just realized it when they were dying. <laughs> Food for thought. John eighteen twelve. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. So this world that we're in is like Alaska. It's like the Arctic. Sub-zero, covered with ice, can't grow anything, can't sustain life. You can barely breathe because it's 75 below zero. I, every five minutes I'd have to take my mittens off and hold my finger on my eyelashes for about 30 seconds to slide the icicles off my eyes because the icicles would get so big on your eyelashes it would close your eyes. And you'd always tell a newcomer, they'd take their mitten off and just pull that ice off and their eyelashes would be with it and they had no eyelashes. You know, ah, you just started here, huh? <laughs> I'd have ice on my mustache and hanging down and icicles I'd have to break off. 70, I, I, the coldest temperature I've seen, up there, 87 below zero still actual still temperature and we were thumping on the thermometer we thought it was a bit cold but colder than that but <laughs> the thermometer got stuck there 87 below zero now you, 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 you some of us have had some experiences that are that bad in life well, we've seen some horrendous things but I ask you is my body in Alaska right now is my spirit in Alaska right now? Is my soul in Alaska right now? And why should my mind be there? If God is taking care of those incidences, why should I even think about it? Because it does not exist in this time quadrant I'm in right now. If I'm in the light right now, it does not exist. God, I began a new life with Him this morning. New life? I'll tell you about new life when God said let there be light <laughs> let there be an earth that was new life when I got up this morning I thought, oh God I need you and the Holy Spirit comes and begins to breathe over me just let there be light in his life this day and the sun of the presence of my living God rises upon the horizon of my day and begins to bring its brilliance that nothing can be hidden from him so that the darknesses that would hold me down from him, my trespasses that are in there, are covered because I bring those to Jesus. Oh, Jesus. I need your forgiveness. I need your washing and cleansing that there would be nothing before me, Lord. And the joy comes because I'm in the light. My soul was ecstatic when I saw the sun and it didn't stop. It didn't stop. I wanted to go stand. If I could have flown somewhere where the sun had been going 24 hours a day, I probably would have bought a ticket to go there just to go stand in the sun. 
There's light. I needed it so much. And there's the problem. We don't understand that light of standing in His presence changes the whole disposition and nature of everything around us. The things of darkness that I beheld when I was up there in the torment, when I would get in the light of my Jesus' presence, it's like they did not exist. The sorrows of losing my children did not exist because he was holding me in his arms. And he said, now, now don't look down. All that's just temporary. Look up. See where you're from. Join me. Be a part of this. Be a part of my celestial heavens. This is where you're from. Keep your eyes fixed up here. Keep your eyes. Look up on me. See the radiance here. Absorb the word that's here. I could not even think of any sorrow. I would burst in great waves of joy, of laughing and zeal, and oh, praises and worship and, and rejoicing and dancing before him. And then I would look down and remember my family. <gasps> oh, my little girls. Two and four. Dreams of my life. My little blondie I carried on my shoulder. Fall in tears, weep uncontrollably. The Lord would come and put his hands upon me. He'd relieve some of the stress and pressures. He said, Curtis, look up. This won't be too much for you if you can stay in my presence. Walk with me. I know it's a great tragedy down there, but don't look down. Look up. Stay in my light. Not only will you survive, but you will receive the joy of my countenance and my presence. So through my darkest hours, my Jesus was there. I needed him. I pressed into him. I sought after his word. I sought after his presence with all my heart because I couldn't exist anywhere else except in the depths of the dungeons of darkness. And oh my God, I don't want to live in the depths of the dungeons of darkness in my mind because that's where everything that counts takes place is wrapped right between my ears. And so I need that light wrapped right between my ears. I refuse to let anything else be in there. Because my great master said that he is the light. I'm in the world and as long as I can keep him, his light present, Whatever ground I set my foot on, the brilliance and radiance and splendor of him goes before me. And it changes the landscape. He is still a creative God. And where there's thorns and briars and, and everybody's down in the dumpers, if my Jesus is standing there, I just think, what are you doing down there? <laughs> you know, everything's swell. Look at him. <laughs> you know, he's got to answer for that. He's going to work that out. I mean, you're not dead. Come on. Get on with your life with God. Focus on him. Look on him. Walk with him. Amen. Psalms 19 and 7. Let's go back. I didn't finish that scripture. John 8, 12. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me. There's the key. See, I got on my face and I followed his every little footstep. If he moved his toenail, I was hanging on to it. <laughs> I was following him. It, because if, he, if we follow him, he says, He who follows me shall not walk in darkness. Do you have any darkness that you need to get out of? Just follow him. Follow him. He says, I'm over here. I'm over here. Don't look back. I'm over here. I've taken care of all the things. I've taken care... He says, but they have the light of life. And that's Zoe. Remember we talked about death. Death means we have no God consciousness. And when there's no God consciousness, everything around us is darkness. Death truly sweeps over our soul. But he says, he is Zoe. And in that Zoe, that light of life, he himself is that, that he will bring that light and deposit it within us said that there is no darkness. I went back to Alaska and I spent some time in his presence. I think the whole north slope lit up because my God was with me. I went back rejoicing and saying, Go God! <laughs> I'd stand there in the darkness with his brilliance shining and I could see a hundred miles across the landscape because of his brilliance. There was no darkness to succumb me. There was nothing that can go past me as long as I can get my God where I'm at and stand in His light. 
And the second I see his light, I'm supposed to go where he's at, right? 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 Psalms 19.7. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. Oh, do you need some reviving? See, if you cast the law of the Lord out, you're not going to get revived. We need his law. And the, we're under the law of the Spirit now. Don't get stuck here. And I want you to know, when that was written, uh, the, 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 there's a lot of the law that's still in effect for you that is good for you that would revive your soul. The statute of the Lord are tr trustworthy, making wise the simple. Now, when I look at that, is it, why would it say the law of the Lord is perfect? It's because that's like the constitution of God for all the celestial beings of his family. It's the overall view of every point of law that there is in its great magnitude of what it will accomplish. And what it will accomplish for all of his subjects is peace. That's the activation of God's thought process of being accomplished in your life in every aspect of him orchestrating every event around you. That's his constitution that I, if I am your God and you are my subject, and I am in you and you are in me, and the light is in you, then everything around you will bow to me. That's peace, not a cessation of events. The statutes. Now he's talking about the little details. Well, not, not little details. <coughs> like state law versus federal law. We have state law, which are lower laws, but yet they have to do with the, the government of our locality, right? So there's statutes of God that have to do with the government of our locality. And if we learn those, then they make us... If they'll make us wise, even if we're simple. Simple means we don't understand the ways of God. Then there's the precepts of God. And that's an over-understanding, uh, an overall understanding of God's heart towards us. It is right towards us. And if we can see that the precepts of the Lord are right, then it gives joy to the heart. Do you need joy? All these things take place when the Word becomes active in our life to get us into the light. It's the doors opening, and I, I, I promise you that if you're in a dark room and you open the doors and the sun's out, uh, the rays of that sun will bounce off of every wall in that room. Right? Right? Even around hidden quarters. You, 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 so we've got our own little private rooms that Satan has talked us into to manage and take care of that we hide in that we take security in, that we don't let anybody else in. We need to get those doors open so His light can come in. Now, now it begins to bring the truth. And we want to walk out when the truth comes out and walk out plainly. We don't need the room anymore. The room needs to be closed. It needs to be blown up. It needs to be burnt down. It needs to be. We need to walk out and come to where the light is. <coughs> Because he says that the commands of the Lord are radiant. And you can only get the commands if your heart is filled with joy about his precepts, statutes, and instructions. His commands are done person to person. And when you receive his commands, then it gives light to the eyes of your soul. I don't know if you know what it's like to be starved to death for light. <coughs> My mother's a person that likes light. In her, in her kitchen, I put in 14 lights. <laughs> Didn't I, Mom? <laughs> it looks like an operating room in there. <laughs> I think they have a brownout over the nuclear reactor when it turns on all the light switches. And I tell you, one of the first things I do when I walk in her kitchen door, I go over and I start hitting every light switch because I, too, am one that I'm filled with joy when I'm exposed to great light. His commands of him standing personally close to us. Because if I receive his statutes and I understand what you say, Lord, is right, and I have joy out of what he says, now he's going to begin to speak to me. And when he speaks, those are called commands. And in that, there's radiant, <coughs> radiance, giving light to my eyes. For the fear of the Lord is pure and enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. Ordinance means uh, instructions of law that are put together for us to live with one another and in certain circles, the family of God. The ordinances of his celestial beings and his celestial family. They're more precious than gold and than much pure gold. 
Ephesians 4 and 17. So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do. <coughs> in the futility of their thinking. See, futility is a comparison to darkness. In the darkness of the mind, in the darkness of our own, uh, if we try to process life on our own, that's like going to Alaska, running off of artificial light, but not having a fuel supply <coughs> to keep them running. It was an amazing thing when we first landed up there, because in that winter, we had, in the summertime, we had launched a barge that was probably three blocks long and three blocks wide, and went and beached it on this sandbar about 150 miles north of Alaska and waited for the ocean to freeze back in because the waters only thaw out where it's not frozen solid ice for six weeks. During that six weeks we had already had that barge loaded and we took that barge and beached it and we took about 30 men and flew them out and no it was actually 70 men and flew them out and landed on that island and went up and started starting up the cranes but before we started the cranes we had to find one of the the light plants to turn the light plant on so we could see to do that because we're working in total darkness with flashlights and until we could get that light plant started then they allowed us to ship just enough fuel that we could start one of those light plants and start one of the cranes the rest of the fuel had to be flown in around the clock which brings us to an understanding if you're in a place of darkness there can be constant fuel that's flown to you to get even the things of God that we know up and running because once we launched a crane and we got a couple of 966's and a 988 those are, those are pretty good sized little forklifts I promise you that <laughs> you know they'll move this house one of those will the 988 will and 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 started offloading all the equipment we had uh, two mantwalk 320 cranes that's two cranes with 320 foot stick arm that's a pretty good sized crane and we started we were able to offload all the equipment and set up this complex 100 man camp that's two stories high and and a, and a, and a, and, a, and a, I could go on and on and on telling you about all the stuff we put on but what it required to do all of that was fuel so if you are stuck in a place of darkness you require fuel to even get the lights on of what you know in God already see there's things you already know in God all you need is an understanding of connecting to the Holy Spirit. Oh, Holy Spirit, because He's a fuel. He's a fuel. I, I need you to shed some light. I, I need you. I'm going to open the doors. Now, shine the light in. And what shows up is those things we need spiritually to begin building with God again and coming out of our little pouty ways. Remember, pouty ways brings darkness. We shut the fuel supply down if we're patties, if we're pity patty or uh, angry Aaron or any other one of those. We 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 cut off the supply of fuel, but we need to get to the point that we are able to come out of that place of darkness. But we've got to survive too, don't we? See, when I say survive, you have to come out of your darkness I have to come out of that darkness by my own will realizing my God is really a good God what he requires of me it's not hard it's not arduous it's liberating what's hard is what when I hang on to things that keep me into darkness there's the hard part is it not it, it puts the burdens upon us. It makes us where we want to live in the... We have to live in the darkness because I don't want to give that up. Oh, it's just too hard for me. <laughs> no, you're fixing to make it hard on yourself because it'll cost you everything else around you because Jesus is not there to protect it. If we live in the darkness, those who live in the darkness, Jesus' light is not there. So let's go on in the scripture here. You, however, did not come to know Christ that way. Surely you heard of him and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its 
deceitful desires. See, there's the thing. Our desires lie to us. Lying Larry. Lying Linda. Our desires lie to us and say they're more important and that's what I need to cater to. Because Satan hits me and says, oh, you, 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 you got a desire in there. you got to cater to that desire. If I cater to that desire, I'm going to go south. I'm, I'm going to get pouty. I'm going to get pity partied. And I'm going to become angry. And I'm going to be frustrated. And now the Holy Spirit supply fuel. The helicopter comes looking and it's shining the lights. Oh, there's the island. Okay, there's a big fuel tank. I'm supposed to drop the fuel in. And it sees somebody down there looking up at the helicopter going, <coughs> Helicopter. Whoa, they don't want fuel. <laughs> and it flies back to the bank. <laughs> right? He's looking for the smiley face so he can land and, 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 and drop off fuel. As a matter of fact, we, we were putting, a, we had a beacon out. We're here, we're here, right here, come and bring the fuel. We waited for the fuel. We had men standing out in 80 below weather waiting to get that fuel in because everything on our island was maintained by that fuel. It was imperative that we get it. Yeah, this, this this operation cost millions and millions of dollars to pull off to drill this wildcat well out in the middle of the Arctic Ocean. No expense was left out. Everything was stripped out of these helicopters and 500-gallon tanks, and they're flying 24 hours a day, trying to keep up, trying to keep up. We're having we're we're heating the Arctic. <laughs> a lot of fuel. So no matter how big your Arctic is, I promise you my God can supply the fuel to heat it up so you can thaw out and get into the light. And once the light comes out, everything melts. Getting on back to the passage of Scripture. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speaking truthfully to his neighbor. For we're not, we, we are all members of one body. In your anger, don't sin. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. Oh, now there's a paradox, isn't it? I become angry, the sun goes down. <laughs> Food for thought for you. And do not give the devil foothold. Who gives the devil foothold? Oh, you did it. It's your fault. I, it, it, you made me do that. <laughs> no? Come on. Get that wrist and turn that finger around and, and say, Don't give the devil a foothold. Come out into the light. Be truthful. Don't let any unwholesome talk come from your come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building up others according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness. Are you bitter? Just just hack up a big loogie and go, I'm not gonna be bitter anymore. Jesus took it. I don't own it. I don't have a right to it. I disclaim it. I will not associate with it. I don't have the right to be bitter about one thing. My Jesus came and laid his life down. He has rescued me and he has offered his dear light where I can live in joy for the rest of my life. I'm not going to step in that little bitter trap. I one time got a trapper's license when I was up in Alaska zillion of arctic foxes up there and those little pelts are worth about a grand a piece now and there are hundreds of them around I thought, whoa I think I'd like to make a big bedspread out of those things <laughs> I started trapping yeah, little creatures I found were, were dead you know because there's traps but I came in one time and one was trapped and he was alive and it ripped my heart out I stopped trapping because the Lord said, this is what Satan does to you if you get stuck in bitterness, if you get stuck in hate. He grabs you and that little dog had nearly chewed his paw off trying to get away. There's bitterness that's stuck in us that are killing us. We're going to have to amputate to get out of that trap of bitterness. We can't live in bitterness. If you live in bitterness, you're living without the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit won't even come near. Bitterness is our choice. It's our right to believe what we want to believe. It's our right to hang on and say, I don't deserve this situation. If you got what you deserved, you would already be a fried marshmallow. If I got what I deserved, I would have been blessed with every wicked thing on earth and separated from God eternity and tortured by the enemy for absolutely ever. I do not want 
what I deserve. Uh, that's a fallacy that gets us into bitterness. Oh, I, I shouldn't have to put up with this. Uh, yeah, you should. <laughs> Matter of fact, if you get in Jesus' presence, you won't have to put up with it. But you don't have the right to say, oh, I shouldn't have to put up with this. You're supposed to rejoice in how many things? Ah, uh, y'all are getting it, huh? Why does he keep saying that? <laughs> Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ as God has forgiven you. How did Christ forgive you? Does he remember anything? He took it to the pit. Have you got something against somebody or something against something that happened in your life? What are you doing hanging on to it? Are you somebody? You need to forgive yourself? I'm not talking about forgive yourself as far as salvation is concerned. Jesus does that. But receive his forgiveness so that it doesn't come up anymore. It's not supposed to be an issue. You're not supposed to be stuck in it. You need deliverance from it because it's not supposed to be a part of you. It causes bitterness. Get rid of it and say, no, Satan, I will not listen to you. I, you're the one that's coming and speaking. See, the problem is, is he sounds like our voice. And he comes in and he speaks to us about how bad we are and how vile we are. And you know what he when he comes and says that you're absolutely right. That's why. Oh Lord Jesus, I thank you. I I just approach you for forgiveness and washing and cleansing because he's right. I'm a wicked, vile thing, and I'll oh, thank you, Jesus. I thank you for your forgiveness. And I won't do that. I won't do that. I'm stopping to do that. That way. He doesn't have a foothold, and he, he can't come stand close to me, and I won't go into bitterness. I won't go into the gray days. I won't be shipped back into the darkness and dread of my life. You don't have to go back to the darkness and dread of your life. You can come out into that light of your dear God. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering. Verse 8, for you were once, but you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. So live as children of the light. For the first fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Do you realize if you're out in the light, you can truly find out what pleases the Lord? It's the most ecstatic thing to find out. You can really do something that pleases Him. You can only find that out if you're in the full light of God's presence. And when God gets pleased, ah, everything changes. When his, He's pleased and His smiling countenance is upon you and you feel His radiant pleasure in you, it gives you ecstatic joy for life that you want to go do. You want to do it right. You want to excel. You want to run yourself absolutely ragged for your God. And it matters not about the trials and tribulations. I'm Jesus is pleased with me. Oh, I'm going to do even more. It becomes a thrilling thing within you. But it's not of you. It's of him. Don't get self-centered and say, oh, I did it right. <laughs> Verse 17, Therefore don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. I'd like to finish with chapter 5. No, chapter 3 of Ephesians. Page 4 on your notes. I'll, I'll, I'll throw in verse 11 in chapter 4. No, verse 13. His, his overall purpose is that we all reach unity in faith. Now, where did faith come from? What's the origin of faith? Faith comes by hearing. So if we are all hearing Jesus, walking in his light, then we're going to come into unity with one another. In that faith, and then there's going to be knowledge of the Son of God that's going to be dispen a dispensation of that poured out upon us so that we become mature attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Jesus himself. That's his overall purpose, is we obtain. We attain the full measure of Jesus. Do you realize that's possible? I believe God. I don't believe men when they say it's impossible. When they say it's impossible, I said, I, I think well, you gave up. You just called God a liar because you want to hang on to your sin and you're not willing to give up. He says that we're supposed to be able to attain to the full measure of Jesus Christ. Not to be the Savior of the world, 
but to be pure in our minds and thoughts and purposes and be about our God's business and service unto him and his children, not children of this dark age, but children of the light, children that belongs to him, the father of lights. He makes the statement, Ephesians 3. His intent was that now through the church, that's you, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known. Do you realize how much the manifold wisdom of God is? See, I worked in a refinery. I know what a manifold is. That's a, that's a pipe with a zillion other pipes hanging on it that go somewhere else, but it's got one main pipe that feeds all those other pipes. And he's saying that the manifold wisdom of God, there's a manifold that has a complete wisdom of God in it with 10 trillion branches on it spewing out his magnificent wisdom that it should be made known to me and to you. Wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly realms also. Do you realize that if you're walking in the wisdom of God, that means the Holy Spirit is with you, Jesus is with you, and now even the angels know that Jesus is walking with you, and who else knows? The other celestial beings, Satan and his henchmen. And if they know Jesus is close to you, boy, they withdraw. You don't have to say, get away from me, stop talking to me. <laughs> You'll hear some screeching and some claws making tracks. <laughs> They'll sound like running rats jumping off the ship. <laughs> and you say, drown, rat, drown. <laughs> in him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. That is God's eternal purpose for us, that we may approach him. You can't approach him unless you learn to live in the light and trust him now. James 14. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm going to read you one other thing. It says, And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long, how high and deep is the love of Christ. That can only take place if you're standing fully in his light, hearing him speak to you, right? Remember, we read Psalms 119, when he, he talked about him speaking to us. His commands bring us into the radiant light. It's radiant light to us. So every good gift and every perfect gift from... Whoop, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I got out of context. In verse 19, and know, knowing this love that surpasses knowledge. See, the, we need to get past knowledge about God and sense and see Him. And that can only take place in the light of His Shekinah presence. So that, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Ah, oh, there's that fullness thing again, huh? Now to Him who is able to do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine. Now who's able to do this? It's impossible for me. But I can take faith. Lord, you said that. You can do this. I have faith in you. I will cooperate with you. But you're going to do beyond what I expect of my... Do you expect any spiritual growth in your life? Do you challenge yourself and say, You know, this year I'm believing my God. I'm going to be obedient to Him, so obedient, that He's going to reveal Himself to me. I'm going to be so obedient that I'm going to stand in line. I'm going to be so obedient that all this mully grubs of life is shaken off of me once and for all. I never have to go back to it. Do you realize I don't have to go back to Alaska today? Do I? Anybody get a gun and they're going to force me on a plane? Well, i got a zillion places I can go once I get on that plane. Even if they escort me, I can still get out of there, can't I? I don't have to go back. You don't have to go back. The place is a memory that is fading that I don't like to go back to because of the pain I don't need to go back to because Jesus rescued me from the darkness 1 Peter 2 and 9 but you are a chosen generation a royal priesthood a holy nation his own special people that you may proclaim his praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light your God is calling you out of your darkness into his marvelous light he waits to embrace you he waits to make you joyful and gleeful that you'll jump up and down 
and not look down anymore. Just look up and trust Him. Shall we pray? Lord, I thank you so much, Lord, that for your great light, for no matter what I am faced with in life, I choose to run out into that light and, oh, your joy always comes no matter what the circumstances. I trust you. You're a righteous God. I love you. I proclaim my allegiance to you. And that includes my obedience. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> amen. I have much more to share with you, as you can tell from the notes. I think we covered about a page and a half of notes. But if y'all want a seminar, y'all can stick around for a week and we'll go over the other pages. <laughs> with that, uh, if anybody was moved and God showed you anything, you'd like to make proclamation of that, we'll take a few minutes to do that. If you don't respond quickly, we will close in prayer and we will dismiss. Ball's in your court. We need a microphone. <coughs> Uh, Rosalind. The thing that God really brought out to me was um, what you said about attitudes and trying to control people. And um, I confess that I have done that. <laughs> and I, I repent of that. And I just thank God that he shows us the light. Amen. Amen. May you never excel at that again. May God assist you. Anyone else? Kim? Uh, what really spoke to me was when you said that we need to receive God's forgiveness. We need to receive God's forgiveness from our past sins so they don't keep coming back to haunt us. And that's something I really struggle with. Now I understand why. I haven't received his forgiveness. I haven't believed that I've been forgiven. And I want to receive it. I want, I want his forgiveness. I want to receive his forgiveness. So I just, I'm not haunted with this, these awful memories of my sins. Mm. I want to be free from them. And I know I, I know I can be. I just have to receive it. Mm. Father, I ask you to give her a new vision, Lord, yes. of total, absolute freedom. The enemy brings accusations, but you are a great God. So give her a new revelation of you coming She's swooping down, sweeping through her soul, and absolutely washing it white as snow again. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Anyone else? Elton? <coughs> A little story. I remember one time I, I was in India with several other men, and we were on a missionary journey, and uh, we were staying in this motel. We called it La Cacarocha, <laughs> and uh, as we... That's a little dog. <laughs> <laughs> we finished up our meetings, and uh, we came back, and it was late in the evening, and we opened the door just like we were going into our own homes and flipped on the light, and there was just a, a flurry of activity, just, just, just... And I, I looked at this other guy, and I said, and then it all calmed down, I said, did I see what I thought I saw? <laughs> and there were lots of them. There's everywhere. But I want to open wide those doors of my life and have those cockroach sins <laughs> see the light of, of the, the true light and, uh, and have to disappear permanently. Amen. 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 Gail? Or, uh, go ahead. Um, one thing that, that I think <coughs> that the Lord's been showing me quite a lot of lately is, is that normally or usually if I'm struggling with something, it's, it's my own fault. I mean, it's my own choice, and, and, and I, I need to let go of it. And there, there was an old scenario on Hee Haw where somebody was always coming into the doctor and saying, Doctor, it hurts in this place, and it hurts in this place. And the doctor says, well, stay out of those places. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's pretty much that simple. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Good. Anyone else? Gail and then Barb. Um, I was just 
um, thinking about how often I'm looking down on my great tragedies, you know, instead of keeping my eyes on the Lord. And and when you um, when you ta- when you talked about just keeping our eyes on the Lord, it just it, it occurred to me um, how much I do look on my great tragedies, and I just want to keep my eyes on the Lord. Mm. Amen. One of the things that you said that I always forget, but I know, but I always forget it, is that the enemy always speaks to us in our own voice. And I'm going to have to write that on a card on my mirror so that when I see, I hear those things in my voice, I know that it's not me. I fall for it every time. It makes me ticked off. (laughs) We need to be ticked off at him. <coughs> Marilee and then Nancy. When you were first talking about joy, it reminded me of an experience I had with the Lord the whole first year I was with Him. I was, well, speaking of tragedies, I was just a walking tragedy. And I would come to the Lord. He was so real to me, and I was bringing all of my baggage with me because I knew he was going to take care of it and I expected him to be so serious about it with me (laughs) and he never was he'd always just say thanks and toss it (laughs) all my great horrible things I was going through or had gone through and then he would laugh and for a while I thought he was laughing at me but then I I realized and I remembered when you were talking he, he was inviting me into joy and that's been my biggest weakness in my life is being so serious about everything I always knit my little brow and just try to figure out how I can do better and I remembered that story when you were talking uh, that he would always he would always just say oh good (laughs) I'm like wait there was my baggage back there and we're up here and you're laughing (laughs) <laughs> yeah, we often want to pull him into our pity parties oh. and discuss it and <laughs> tell him how miserable we are. He was completely uninterested in it, and he would say, let's go. And I'm like, but weren't we going to fix that? <laughs> 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 so I repent of <laughs> the importance of my serious thought. Amen. I would like some joy. Amen. <laughs> Anyone else? Nancy? And who's after Nancy? Tonight during worship, I was just awestruck again about how that my Lord is just keeps me, helps me because of the desire of my heart to not go back into those places again. And it's just so amazing to me. And you've reiterated that again tonight, that we don't have to go back there. We don't have to be there. We're here. We're not in Alaska. We don't have to let our mind have to go to Alaska either. And I'm just so, so thankful for that. And the other thing that you said tonight, which it just sent my mind into a whirlwind, was the idea God is God, and he is all present, all places, always. But he is not looking at our sin. Mm -hmm. It's cast away, and he doesn't look at it. And I go, oh, that one's a big one. I'm trying to figure that one out. But I don't even care. I don't want to figure it out. I just thank the Lord. Thank the mm. Lord. I love it that he's cast our sin away. Yeah. And then when I do fresh sin, Jesus is standing there interceding. Providing forgiveness. Donna? Um, I had a dream once. And in my dream, um, the Lord and I were dancing around my grave. And um, the Lord kept throwing his head back and laughing with joy, and like he was trying to show me how to do this. And we was holding hands, and we were dancing around my grave, and I thought that that was so cool, and I have to keep remembering that, to, to dance around my grave and forget it, forget all my past, my past life. Thank Amen. you. <laughs> he rejoices in bringing up a new creature. And him. Yeah. Amen. Anyone else? Last call. Kevin. <coughs> uh, 
uh, when you said rejoice in things always, that's what I really need to recognize is uh, he brought back to remembrance to me is, you know, even in my darkest times, I can rejoice and it's through those tough, those tough times that he's refining me by fire <coughs> of me, myself, and I, and that I need to repent from me and myself and I and learn to cling to him, to come to him for those needs and that he, uh, he will show me. Yes, he will. He will. Praise God. Last call, last call. Anyone else? Shall we bow our hearts before the Lord? Lord, we thank you for your light. We thank you for making it available. Give us a thirst for your light, Lord. Make it where we will not just stay in the shadows and settle for just a little reflective light, but give us a genuine thirst and hunger to get into your bright light that all things will be set free in us by your great power. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen? Amen. Well, if y'all could help... Uh, Rearrange the lodge. Rearrange the lodge here. I would appreciate that. We've got uh, proverbs this uh, Saturday. Could use all the help we could ne use. And uh, Jackie, we're gonna, um, I guess load up on Thursday afternoon. You, you're going to have to come get the microphone.